The sound in my headphones comes from out of nowhere. A corresponding line suddenly appears on my waterfall display. Contact! Bearing 090, I say, pulling my left headphone fully over my ear so I can listen with both ears. Classify, the sonar chief says from behind me, his voice slightly muffled. Copy, I reply, then turn to Burke, the other sonar technician. Track it, I tell him. Copy, Burke says. Tracking. Contact holding steady at 090. The sound is strange, but I can tell right away that it's not man-made. Unless the Russians have developed some amazing technology that we haven't even dreamt of yet, not likely. Biologic, I say. I feel everyone around me relax at the classification. I relax slightly, but I still listen. The sound is like no other biological I've heard. It's not a whale or a school of fish or even pistol shrimp. It's something else. There's something strange about this. It's contact changing direction, bearing 060, Burke says. It's moving fast. I immediately notice the difference in my headphones. The sound that reaches the passive sonar array on the sub intensifies. Whatever it is, it's loud and it's close. Plotter, how soon until it reaches us? Chief says to Smith. Smith does his quick calculations before answering. 90 seconds, sir. You're sure it's biologic, Perez? Chief asks me. Yes, sir, I say. What about you, Burke? You agree? Chief asks. Yes, sir, Burke says. But I couldn't tell you what it is. There's cavitation, and it's moving fast. Okay, Chief says. Well, whatever it is, it won't mess with us. Maybe it's just a curious whale. The sound changes in my headphones, shifting into something wholly different. Suddenly, there's more than one source, or the thing is making the same noise from multiple points at different times. What the hell? I say. Sir, it must be a group of something that was traveling in formation, but it's not anymore. Whatever it is just broke up, but it's still moving toward us, Burke says. My mind goes back to the meeting we had the previous day about our mission. Most of the time, enlisted Navy personnel like me aren't filled in on the classified stuff that the captain, XO, and other officers know. But the stuff they told us yesterday wasn't classified. It was alarming though. It wasn't really relevant to our mission, but the XO told us that we would be passing close to the Kara Sea. Off the coast of Russia, the sea had been used as a dumping ground for nuclear waste and decommissioned Russian nuclear submarines for decades. He said that over six times the radiation released at the Hiroshima bombing during World War II was now sitting at the bottom of the Kara Sea. Some of the materials hadn't even been dumped deep. There were plenty of decaying containers with radioactive material in shallow parts of the Kara Sea. So as the sound in my headphones grows louder and remains inexplicable, all I can think of are some strange, deformed sea creatures swimming up to our submarine. But that's ridiculous, isn't it? This isn't some B movie made in the 60s. It's real life. Whatever it is, it'll be gone soon. Sea creatures have never been known to attack a submarine, Chief says. I feel like I should object, like we should do something, but there's nothing to be done. It's not like we could fire a torpedo at the things. That would be ridiculous. So I just listen as the seconds tick by, waiting for whatever is causing the noise to pass. Submariners often hear things on sonar that they can't directly identify. Maybe once the data is analyzed back in the States, they'll figure out what it is. Maybe it's just a loud bang resonates through the ship, followed by another and another. All of a sudden, it's as if there are two dozen hammers hitting the hull. I have to rip off my headphones to keep my ears from being damaged. What the hell is that? What's going on, sonar chief? Exo says. No one has an answer. We all just sit or stand in our positions, wincing at each new bang. But then it stops. Everything is quiet again. I put my headphones back on, but hear nothing out of the ordinary. Just normal sounds that passive sonar picks up underwater. Commander Scott comes into the control room quickly, moving faster than I've ever seen. What was that? Are we under attack? I don't know, Captain, Chief says, the fear plain in his voice. Contact classified as a biologic, moving fast toward us. Then it banged into us. That didn't sound like an it. Commander Scott says. It sounded like a them, 
And lots of them. What is passive sonar picking up? Nothing, sir, Chief says, pointing to our waterfall displays. He's right. I'm not hearing anything strange anymore. A screeching sound suddenly erupts, causing me to once again pull my headphones off. Captain, there's something on the hull. It sounds like ripping metal. Scott steps past Chief in the cramped compartment and looks at the waterfall display, which is showing one thick, slightly wavy line, a representation of the sound the passive sonar is picking up. His eyes go wide. He reaches his hand out, and I hand him my headphones. He listens to them for about a second, then hands them back. Holy God, something's trying to tear us apart, he says. Something biologic? Chief says. Not possible. Scott ignores him, turning to dive control. Make all preparations for surfacing. Make all preparations for surfacing. The dive control officer repeats into his radio, broadcasting the order to the rest of the ship. The screeching sound coming from the passive sonar array is now filling the entire waterfall display screen, making it look like static on an old television. Something shifts and the entire sub shakes. Alarms start going off. Hole breach! Someone shouts. Emergency blow, emergency blow! Commander Scott says. I look over in time to see one of the officers flip the chicken switches next to the helmsman. Almost immediately, I feel the submarine angle up as high pressure air forces water out of the ballast tanks, making us lighter. 300 feet, Chief says. I lift my headphones to my ears again. 250 feet. And I don't hear any more screeching. We're going up toward the surface fast. Maybe we've knocked them all off, whatever they are. 200 feet. Everyone's leaning forward to compensate for the angle. I'm leaning to the side since my seat faces the port side of the vessel. 150. Hull breach? What the hell could have breached the hull? 100 feet. The tense air in the control room seems a little less so now. 50 feet. There's almost a feeling of weightlessness as the nose plunges through the surface of the water. Then we flatten out, rocking slightly on the ocean's surface. We couldn't have done this if it had been wintertime. Thankfully, it's summer, so there's not a layer of ice to keep us from floating on the surface to survey and hopefully repair the damage. Commander Scott tells a couple of senior enlisted men to go up and get a visual check on the sub's exterior. We all wait while the XO goes with them to the small arms locker to hand them weapons. They come back up again, and I see that one guy has a shotgun and the other a 45. They make their way up to the bridge so they can look down on any potential threats from above. The whole control room waits silently for them to come back and report. A gunshot rings out, echoing down into the sub's interior. It's followed quickly by a scream and a thud. Suddenly, the men gathered around the vertical ladder to the bridge are all shouting. I can just see the backs of the men there through the narrow doorway from the control room. And the next instance, they're trying to scatter, which is easier said than done in the cramped space of the submarine. One of them, a big man named Salazar, turns around, moving toward the control room. His eyes are wide with fear. Something dark and wet drops down behind him. And before Salazar can step through the hatch into the control room, something erupts from the center of his chest. He looks down at it. It's a dark colored, pointed, spear-like thing, sticking a couple of inches out of his flesh and through his blue uniform shirt. Everyone in the control room is silent for a second, wondering what the hell is happening. Salazar falls forward, revealing a black, crab-like creature standing about four feet tall. Two black eyes jut forward from its domed shell. Slowly, the creature puts the outstretched and blood-covered front leg down. It clicks as it touches the metal floor. The black eyes stare into the control room, a couple of long antennae waving in the air over its eye stalks. It looks like a crab, in that it has segmented legs that are longer at the front of its body and shorter at the back. But instead of two arms tipped with claws, it has two long, segmented arms that end in what looks like three large, sharp fingers, what would be two index fingers and a thumb on a human. It has six legs total, besides the strange arms, and its prickly black mouth opens and closes, as if tasting the air. Behind it, several more of these creatures drop into the submarine and scurry up into a line. One of them climbs up into a wall like a spider, using its legs and finger claws to hold on. Commander Scott stands there, the closest to them, 
still as a statue. The lead creature turns around and the rest of the creatures follow suit. They scuttle off into the submarine. This seems to break Commander Scott's trance and he lunges over to a radio. Repel borders, repel borders. Use whatever means necessary. Multiple hostiles on board. This echoes all over the submarine. And just as soon as he puts the radio up, we hear a commotion from the direction the creatures went. What are those things? Burke asks. I don't know, Scott says. But we need to stop them. Should we close the bridge hatch? I ask. There might be more out there. Yes, Burke, you close the hatch, Scott says. Daniels, you've recently had your firearms qualification, right? Yes, sir, I say, a little over a month ago. You're with me, he says. You too, Chief. The rest of you, stay put and keep this submarine on the surface. Johnson, get a message to the Admiral. After this flurry of commands, Scott, Chief, and I head deeper into the submarine. We go down a level and come across the XO, Delaney. He's sitting propped against the wall outside the dry storage area. He's clearly dead, his face torn apart to the point where he's unrecognizable. The only way we know he's the XO is because of his cloth nameplate. He had been bringing more weapons up from the small arms locker, as evidenced by the two shotguns and three 45 caliber pistols lying on the floor next to him, sticky with his blood. Scott reaches down without a word and grabs three weapons. He gives me and Chief a shotgun each and keeps a pistol for himself. We've been hearing screaming and shouting from ahead, so we move quickly through dry storage, finding another two bodies. They were the cooks, each with a knife nearby. We enter the crew's mess, which is the most open room on the sub. It's about the size of a large studio apartment with six booths placed around and a place for food to be served. I move in directly behind Commander Scott to see two of the creatures fighting with two crewmen. There's blood everywhere. Bodies litter the floor. These men have no weapons, aside from what they can find around, which isn't much. I raise my shotgun up and aim it at one of the creatures, but it's on a man's shoulders, its sharp legs piercing the guy's back. With its claw-like hands, it takes chunks out of his face, neck, and chest with quick stabs. If I fire, I will probably kill the man. Scott fires first, rushing into the room and putting the barrel of his 45 directly to the back of a creature that's attacking a screaming man on the ground. He fires four times before the creature stops moving. Taking a hint from him, I move closer to the creature in my sights, almost falling as I step on a body. I get close enough for reasonable accuracy and fire. The creature falls off the man's shoulders onto its back on the floor, its six legs scrambling in the air. I step over and put another blast into its belly. It stops moving. The man it was attacking sits down at a booth. He's bleeding profusely out of his many wounds. He puts his head down on the table without a word. I doubt he's going to be alive for much longer. The rest of them are in here somewhere, Scott says. Chief stands at the entrance to the mess, looking at the carnage. He's either too scared or too shocked to be much help. I remember yesterday's meeting. The reactor, I say. I bet that's where they're at, the reactor. Commander Scott looks up at me with confusion at first, but then a reluctant understanding comes over his face. Let's go. We move through a stubby hallway and see that the door to the reactor compartment is open. As we move closer to the door, I can hear faint beeping noises from inside the room. It's a dosimeter, or more likely several dosimeters, worn by the reactor technicians, warning of high radiation levels. You hear that? I whisper. Everything is quiet in the reactor compartment, aside from the beeping. Scott nods, but continues toward the door. I follow. There are several bodies just inside the reactor compartment doorway. They look like they've been torn apart in a frenzy. They're each wearing an electronic dosimeter, and all of them are beeping. Look, Scott says, pointing. I look, seeing several of the crab creatures huddling up next to the reactor, as if they're sleeping. They must have damaged the reactor to get at the radiation, I say, raising my shotgun so I can be ready to kill them when Scott gives the go-ahead. But he doesn't. He reaches inside and closes the door, latching it. What are you doing? I ask. We can't fire guns in there. We'll kill everyone left on the ship. We don't know what they did to the reactor either. We just have to hope someone will get to us soon. 
Hope that the reactor doesn't melt down in the meantime. Or, God forbid, we attract more of those f***ing things. I lower my shotgun. We do what we can for the injured crew members. And we stay on the surface as we head away from the Kara Sea to meet up with an aircraft carrier and a couple of destroyers. It's been a couple of hours since the attack, and now I'm back on sonar in the control room. Every moment that passes, I expect those things to try to escape the reactor compartment, but they don't. And as we head through the Barents Sea toward Norway, I finally start to think we'll be okay. We're getting more radiation than is recommended, but the levels this far from the reactor aren't lethal. But then something pops up on the passive sonar, something biologic, something fast, and it's coming right at us. Michelson's face is unrecognizable. It's severely swollen and splotchy where it was once healthy and vibrant. Blood and pus seep through his skin like sweat, staining the white sheets under him red and pink. He's calm now, but it won't last. He'll be awake again, writhing in pain, screaming, and begging to die. He's the toughest man I've ever known, and seeing him like this is a special sort of torture. But I can help him. I have a 45 caliber pistol on my hip. It would be easy to put him out of his misery. And maybe I will. Maybe that's what we should all do. I wonder if there are 146 bullets on board this submarine. Surely, there are enough to go around. Otherwise, I fear we're all facing a long, painful, and slow death. I boarded the submarine with 15 other Navy SEALs at Kings Bay Naval Submarine Base. All our equipment was already loaded on the ship, except the small packs that we each carried with us for the few days we would be on board. It wasn't my first time getting on a nuclear-powered submarine to hitch a ride somewhere, so it did not surprise me to hear the submariners grumble about freeloading oxygen breathers as we got on board. They pretended like they were saying it under their breath, but they really wanted us to hear it. A little Navy to Navy sh talking. But I laughed it off. Navy SEALs are, by definition, the best of the best. These guys got jokes, Michelson said from behind me as one of the submariners showed us through the cramped vessel. Let them have their jokes, I said to him, loud enough for anyone in earshot to hear me. You'd have to have a good sense of humor to stay on one of these death traps for months at a time. <laughs> Michelson laughed. Hey, he said with mock outrage. The U.S. Navy submarines have had a spotless record in recent years. Not a crash or a meltdown. Before Michelson could get the entire word out, the guy leading us into the sub spun around. Don't say it, he shouted. At first, I thought he was joking, but his face told me differently. It's bad luck to talk about that stuff on the sub, he said. He was a young guy whose cloth nameplate read Parks. He really took this stuff seriously. All right, man, Michelson said. I didn't know. Just a little friendly razzing. Parks looked at us for a moment, while the guys behind us grumbled about the holdup. Then he turned around and led us deeper into the sub. We passed submariners pretty much everywhere. Sometimes we had to squeeze past each other with not an inch to spare. Much more intimate than I like my travel. But I went where Uncle Sam told me to go and how he told me to get there. Parks showed us our bunks, which were about the size and shape of a coffin, with the big difference being there was no lid, only curtains on the one open side. You had to slide in sideways and close the curtains if you wanted any privacy. These bunks were stacked four high and six deep in one cramped corridor, a total of 24 beds in one particular stretch of hallway. Each of the little beds lifted up, revealing a shallow box where our clothing and any personal gear would go. We unloaded our packs into our assigned bunks and then wandered out to the crew's mess while submariners buzzed about us, getting ready to embark. One of the guys on my team, Holloway, produced a deck of cards and we spent an hour or so playing. We heard some announcements about getting underway the and then we felt the sub move. Stay Soon after, a submariner came through the mess and said, get ready for the angles and dangles, gentlemen. Sure enough, we felt the sub tilt as it dove, making us lean back or forward in our seats. 
depending on which way we were facing. After a couple of minutes, the sub leveled out and we were on our way. There were about 10 of us SEALs in the mess, including Michelson and Holloway. The rest of the guys were either in their bunks or working out in whatever small space they could find where they wouldn't be disturbed. Since we didn't have any jobs to do, we were just killing time. It would be four days until we were in position to insert into a foreign country where we weren't officially supposed to be. So we had four days to kill. Unfortunately, things went to shit on the third day and they went to shit real quick. I awoke to alarm klaxons. I hit my head on the bunk above me as I tried to sit up. Guys were running through the tight hallway toward the bow of the ship. One submariner almost tripped over me as I swung out of the bunk. What the hell is going on? I asked him, but he ignored me. And as I stood up, I realized that the sub was tilting up slightly. Presumably, we were surfacing. Holloway appeared behind me, squeezing himself against the wall of bunks as more young men ran past. You know what's going on? I asked him. I couldn't read his face as he looked at me. It looked the same as ever, calm, cool, and collected. But the words he spoke chilled me to my core. I heard one of them saying something about the reactor. You're kidding, this must be a drill. These reactors have redundancies and fail-safes, don't they? Not one serious reactor problem during the whole nuclear submarine program, as I understand it, Holloway said. But the Russians have had some serious problems. Yeah, well, we're not the f***ing Russians, I said, moving forward toward the mess. Holloway followed. A bunch of SEALs were in the crew's mess, sitting or standing around. Ten of them, to be exact. As Holloway and I walked in, that made twelve. There were four missing, and one of them was Michelson. Where's everyone else? I asked Lieutenant Lyons, who sat in the corner with a toothpick in his mouth, sticking out of his bushy black beard. Michelson and Dunn went up to see if they could help with whatever the hell's going on. I don't know where Cruz and Stokes are. I'm sure they're here somewhere, Lyons said. Everyone was silent for a long time. The only sounds were the alarm klaxons echoing throughout the ship and the occasional garbled orders barked over the sub's internal communication system. You think this is a drill? Holloway asked Lyons. No, Lyons said. That shut us up for even longer. Suddenly, the entire sub shook, as if we just hit something. I couldn't tell if we were moving or not, but I assumed we weren't. I had no idea where in the world we were, or how close we were to help, and I knew next to nothing about nuclear reactors. Some commotion caught my attention. The sound of men talking hurriedly grew closer. Three submariners appeared in the doorway to the mess, walking sideways because they were carrying a person between them. Move, clear a table, one of them said. The seals at the nearest table got up and the submariners put the man down. He was another submariner, but the skin of his hands and face was covered with third degree burns. He was unconscious or dead. I couldn't tell which. Three more men entered the mess carrying another submariner, and I recognized Michelson and Dunn as two of the three. They put their man on another table. This guy was also badly burned, but only on one side of his body. He reminded me of the Batman villain Two-Face, only without the neat line that divided his damaged and undamaged skin. There were splotches of burnt skin on his face, as if he'd been splashed with burning water. And that, I soon learned was close to what had happened. I went up behind Michelson and Dunn, peering over their shoulders for a closer look. Michelson saw me from the corner of his eye. Get back, he said. Don't touch any of this. What happened? I asked. Something happened with the reactor, Michelson said, unbuttoning his shirt. We've all been exposed to high levels of radiation. It's all over our clothes. One of the submariners looked up at me and the other seals standing around. The safety valves failed, he said in a voice tight with disbelief. The steam, the pressure was too much. It's not supposed to happen. It can't happen. The pressure vessel, he trailed off, seeming to realize that he, too, was covered in radiation because he started taking off his clothing. When the men were all stripped to their underwear, their clothes set in a corner of the room, they worked on taking the clothes off of the two burned and unconscious men. The rest of us watched helpless to do anything. With all the training we had, we'd never been trained for something like this. We could do nothing but watch. 
Michelson suddenly stepped away and threw up on the floor. He looked up at me, shame on his face, but no fear. Once they got the clothes off the burned men, a man who I assumed was the ship's corpsman appeared with a first aid kit and started treating their burns as best he could. This is Commander Ramsey speaking. The calm voice came over the sub speakers, causing all of us but the corpsman to stop what we were doing. I won't sugarcoat this. You've all been trained well, and you all know what you've signed up for. So I'll tell this to you straight. We've suffered a catastrophic accident involving the reactor. I've tried to blow the ballast tanks to get us to the surface, but this doesn't seem to be possible. Without the reactor, we can't move. So we're currently sitting on a sea shelf about 400 feet under the surface of the water. I've been in contact with the Navy, and they're sending help, but it won't get here for several days. In the meantime, we need to sit tight and stay cool. We'll get through this. I looked at Lieutenant Lyons, and then at Michelson and Dunn. Their faces betrayed no emotion, but I was pretty sure mine did. 24 hours passed in mostly tense silence. They had sealed the reactor compartment because of high radiation levels, but those in the control room were receiving higher than normal doses, so they kept the crew there to a minimum and rotated them frequently. After several hours of vomiting and confused babbling following the initial exposure, Michelson seemed fine. He hadn't thrown up anymore, and he said he felt normal. Dunn had started showing symptoms about an hour after Michelson. Apparently, he had followed Michelson into the reactor compartment to help get the burned men out. 24 hours later, he seemed okay, just like Michelson. The corpsman said it wouldn't last. The two men who had been burned in the reactor compartment had been vomiting and convulsing since shortly after they'd been brought out. The corpsman said they'd be dead within days, if not hours. None of the news we got was good. So when Lyons came and found me lying in my bunk, I knew things were about to get worse. It wasn't his face that told me. It was the lack of a toothpick in his mouth. He meant business. Listen, he said. I've just finished telling the others what Commander Ramsey told me. He says the oxygen tanks will run out tomorrow. They can't produce any more oxygen because the reactor powered those systems. But he said they have oxygen candles we can burn. The question is whether they'll get to us before they run out. Jesus, I said. He thinks we're going to run out of air before they get here? He doesn't know, maybe, Lyons said. But that's not the most concerning part of our situation. You're kidding. What is it? Killer sea monsters closing in on us? Lyons shook his head, clearly not in the mood for tasteless jokes. Ramsey says we're hanging off a sea shelf. He says the sub has been shifting slowly for the past day, but now it's speeding up, and he thinks there's a chance the sub could plummet off the shelf. And let me tell you, it's a long drop. I thought the angle was changing, I said. Is the drop long enough for the compression to kill us? Lyons nodded. But we have our equipment on board. We could swim out. And leave them all behind? No, we have our dive gear. They have some escape suits or something. But we can only go through the lockout trunk so many at a time. It can only fit so many. Since we're guests on this ship, Commander Ramsey wants us to go first. What would we do? Just float on the surface of the ocean and hope that rescue ships show up before we die? That's if we make it to the surface alive. From 400 feet, that's not guaranteed, I said. Lyons shrugged. I know the risks as well as you do. There are no good options here. We can wait to die in here or try our chances in the ocean. This is insane, I said. F***ing insane. Just telling you what our options are. Lyons left me then, and I thought about leaving the ship in our scuba gear. It wasn't a better option than staying on the sub, at least not as things were. Even if we did survive the swim, we would be abandoning them to their fate, hoping that they could escape. Even if they had enough escape gear to get everyone off, I didn't like it. Now it has been two days since the reactor accident. The air has grown foul. The levels of carbon dioxide are climbing, even though we're burning the oxygen candles regularly. Michelson and Dunn both took a turn for the worst hours ago. Their skin is degrading, swelling, and turning waxy. They're delirious, often crying out in pain. They're sweating blood as their insides are being destroyed on a cellular level. 
The rest of the people on board are trying to do as little as possible in an effort to conserve oxygen. One man had to be sedated after he lost it and started screaming about not wanting to die this way. I stand next to Michelson's bunk looking down at him, thinking about putting a bullet in his head, just like he's asked me to do at least a half dozen times now. And I think about putting a bullet in my own. My chances are only slightly better if I do what Lyons wants and swim out of the sub. But I know I'll take the chance. I don't have a choice. I know we should have left by now to give the submariners more oxygen. So it's time to leave, to say goodbye. Lyons and the rest of the team are waiting for me near the lockout trunk. I volunteer to say the last goodbye. I grab Michelson by the hand. His skin feels loose, as if a strong yank would separate it from his muscle. He's delirious now, half conscious. His swollen lips are cracked and bleeding. I put the barrel of my pistol to his head and say one last goodbye to my good friend. And then I pull the trigger. Dunn is next, and he's semi-conscious. He looks up at me from between his swollen eyelids. His lips move. Do it, he whispers. Please. It's been a pleasure, I say, putting the barrel to his head. And then I pull the trigger. The submariners are silent as I pass them their bloodshot eyes following me as I head to the lockout trunk. The sub shifts under our feet, the angle growing steeper. There isn't much time. Commander Ramsey is outside the lockout trunk. He shakes my hand before I suit up in my diving gear. Thanks for the ride, Commander, I say. He smiles weakly. Good luck. Once I'm suited up, I join the rest of my team in the lockout trunk. Ramsey seals it from his side, and shortly after, Water pours in from the ocean. It's freezing cold, even through the wetsuit. As the water fills up and the pressure changes, I have my doubts that all of us will live through this. 400 feet is a long way to go, and the oxygen in our tanks actually becomes toxic at this depth. The best thing to do is take one breath and swim hard for the surface, hoping we don't end up with nitrogen bubbles in our brains. So we each take a single deep breath from our tanks before the pressure inside the trunk equalizes with the outside pressure. If we don't die from the bends, we'll probably have some serious injuries. But I guess that's better than dying choking in an airless submarine. Once the lockout trunk is full, Lyons opens the door to the ocean and we swim out, one by one, each of us exhaling slowly as we go up. This is because as the pressure changes, The gas in our lungs expands, so we need to exhale to avoid rupturing our lungs. There's enough sunlight filtering down, so I can see the submarine growing smaller beneath me as I swim up. It seems to be moving. I watch as it slides off the gray sea shelf, plunging in slow motion down into the black depths below. No submariners managed to get out. There wasn't enough time. Maybe it's better this way for some of them, Instead of dying slowly and painfully from a lack of oxygen, the pressure will crush the submarine once it gets to a certain depth, killing those on board quickly. I turn my attention back up toward the ocean surface, breathing out of my mouth as I ascend. Since the gas in my lungs is expanding as I go up, it feels as if my lungs are staying full even though I'm not taking a breath. After nearly four minutes, I break the surface of the ocean. Some of the other guys are already up, and I see that many of them are bleeding from the nose. The water in front of me is pink, and a finger to my upper lip reveals that I'm bleeding too. Off in the distance, I see a ship of some kind, and it looks like it's coming closer. A rescue boat, too late to save the crew. I notice that two guys are missing as I look around. Where are Gibbons and Sanchez? I ask Lyons. He just shakes his head. I can feel an ache settling into my joints, and I know I have the bends. I'm sure we all do, but we're alive, which is more than I can say for the 130 men left on the sinking submarine. I look at the pile of mutilated bodies in the submarine's control room. The gorge is rising in my throat. Blood covers much of the equipment and instrumentation in the room. The bodies are so hacked up and mangled that I can't recognize any of them. And before I can investigate further, I sense movement nearby. 
A man stands about 15 feet away in the open hatchway, leading to the sonar room. It's dark in there, so what I see is shrouded in shadows. The first thing I notice is that something is wrong with his ears, like they have some strange growths about the size and shape of golf balls. His mouth is open in an O shape, but it looks like he's holding something round between his lips, something that seems to move. The structure of his face is distorted somehow. It's not the shape of a normal human face. There are strange ridges and bumps all over, and I'm almost certain that his eyes are covered in some of these strange growths. I take all this in quickly, the adrenaline spiking through my body. So when I notice that the thing standing on the other side of the hatchway is holding a Navy issue combat knife, I turn and run. I jump through another doorway, one designed to separate compartments in case of a breach. And I'm just about to close the door when someone calls out to me. A man appears from an adjacent doorway. A man I know is Clemens. What's going on? He calls. Come on, I say. What's going on? He says again. Look behind you. Clemens turns and sees the thing with a knife coming down the corridor. He takes one look at it and runs toward me, hopping through the hatchway so I can shut the door. They've gone insane. Clemens says, as I turn the handle to seal the door. There's something wrong with them. Their faces. I saw, they're not themselves, I tell him. It's not your run of the mill insanity. Something else is happening. I feel the handle move. Find something to jam this up, will you? I say to Clemens. That thing is trying to open the door. What if there are more on this side? He says. One thing at a time, I say. Clemens, a kid of maybe 20, nods his head and goes off to find something for the door. The handle moves again, and this time it feels like there's more than one person on the other side. I don't know how much longer I can hold it. Hurry up! I call, still holding the handle with all my strength. I glance over my shoulder. Clemens is coming down the hall with a large wrench in his hands. I see movement behind him, just the shoulder of someone following closely. There's someone behind you! I yell out. It's okay! Clemens says, moving slightly so I can see the face of the man following him. It's Burrell, a sonar technician, and his face looks normal. I breathe a sigh of relief, allowing myself to relax slightly. As soon as I loosen my grip on the door's handle, it is yanked out of my hand and starts spinning quickly. The door unseals and starts to open, but I reach out and grab it, struggling to pull it back into place. Clemens and Burrell join me, and we're all three pulling on the door, fighting against the forces on the other side. We spin the handle and work hard to keep it spinning until the door is secured. Clemens picks up the wrench that he dropped and jams it at an angle between the handle and another metal door component, essentially locking the door for now. We step away from the door, panting and sweating. What the hell was that all about? Burrell says. What's going on? I don't know, I say. Something's wrong with one, or some, of the crew. What do you mean, something? What's wrong with them? Their faces are all messed up, Clemens says. Not normal. Someone killed a bunch of people in the control room, I say. I saw the bodies. Burrell looks at the wrench stuck in the door. Whatever is on the other side is still trying to turn the handle, but it's not budging. He sits on the ground. You think this has something to do with the weird stuff we experienced yesterday? He asks. I had the same thought. We'd been on a routine patrol when all the instruments started going haywire at once. Something that is nearly impossible under normal circumstances. We'd been pretty deep, 1500 feet or so, and had some anomalous readings right before everything went crazy. Or at least that's what I heard. I wasn't on shift at the time. Apparently, the sub had gone blind. We couldn't tell how deep we were, where we were, or even whether we were moving. But Commander Ryan had kept his cool and started diagnostics on the various systems to figure out the problem. Still, it wasn't an all-hands emergency, so I'd gone to sleep along with the rest of my shift. I'd awoken to an eerily quiet boat and made my way to the control room. That's when I found the dead bodies. I'd say it's a pretty good bet that it has to do with the weird stuff that happened yesterday. But there must be more of us here. It's just not possible that nearly 140 people have been killed. I don't buy it. There'd be bodies everywhere. It's a big ship, but let's check the bunks, Clemens says. See if anyone is back there. 
I don't suppose either of you can get into the small arms locker, can you? I ask. Both men shake their heads. Okay, let's go, I say. Burrell, stay here and keep an eye on this door. If anything happens, give us a shout. Burrell doesn't look like he's fond of the idea, but he stands up and nods his head anyway. Clemens and I head back to the bunks and start opening the navy blue curtains obscuring the beds. We check eight bunks before we find anyone. Morton's here, Clemens says. I turn around and see Morton curled up in a fetal position in his bunk. His eyes are wide, staring blankly through us. What the hell happened, Morton? I ask him, shaking him. His eyes shift up to my face, but they're still blank with what I suspect is shock and disbelief. They let them in, Morton says. Before any of us knew what they were doing, they let them in. Who? Who let what in? I ask. Commander Ryan in the XO. They flooded the escape trunk and opened the hatch to let them in. There's nothing we can do. Nothing. We're stuck in this tin can with them. Where's everyone else? Clemens asks. Where's the commander? Gone, Morton says. They're f***ing gone. He's lost it, I say. Let's look for more. Burrell's screams cut my words off. Both Clemens and I look toward the sound. I know instinctively that Burrell is in serious trouble. The scream was one of tremendous pain. See? Morton says. He reaches out and pulls the curtain closed over his bunk, determined to wallow in his insanity until they find him, whatever the hell they are. As the noise of footsteps drifts down the hall toward us, I know we need to move. Let's go, I say to Clemens. If we can get to the mess, we can arm ourselves with knives. It's better than nothing. Clemens nods, and we both make our way past the bunks, past the empty officer's wardroom, through the dry storage area, and into the mess. We each select a kitchen knife quickly, the sound of footsteps following behind us. The closest sealable compartment is the torpedo room. Not only is it the closest place to seal ourselves in, but there's also a slim chance that one of us could escape through a torpedo tube. Not both of us, but one. And that would be a last resort. But it seems that we're closing in on a last resort scenario pretty quickly. The torpedo room door is closed, so we have to open it. And as we do, Burrell and several other figures appear behind us. I'm busy opening the door, but Clemens sees them coming. Oh my God, he says. It's Burrell, they got him, hurry. I can hear the footsteps coming, but I can't risk the glance back. It would waste precious seconds. I get the door open and let Clemens go first. Then I step in, and as I close the door, I glimpse back at Burrell, only it's not him anymore. His face is swollen and bumpy, as if a bunch of smooth pebbles of various sizes have been shoved under the skin of his face. His mouth is open, holding a round object, and I realize that it's an eye, about twice the size of a human eye. It's bloodshot and has a mottled red and black iris around the staring pupil. The other eyes seem to have grown out of his ears. All three of them are staring at me. Burrell's own eyes are swollen shut with the bulbous configurations under his skin. I get the door closed and spin the handle as quickly as I can, sealing it shut. Clemens appears by my side with a socket wrench and a spare hydraulic tube both of which we shove into the door to keep the handle from moving. Let's get you out of here, I say, running over to a torpedo tube to open it. What? Through a tube? Clemens says. There should be a survival suit in here somewhere. Find it and put it on. You're insane. I'll never survive. We're too deep. Clemens, I say. Do you think you'll survive if you stay here? This way, at least you have a chance. I hold the lever to open the torpedo tube's interior door. Once it's open, I step around to look inside. Something small jumps out at me. On reflex, I duck, and it sails over my head to land on Clemens. I turn to look at the thing as it scurries up from where it landed on his lower abdomen. It's about the size of my hand, and looks like a cross between a starfish and a squid. It has five arms, each ending in sharp tips made of some kind of shell-like material. Aside from these little tips, its skin is clear enough to see the little red and blue veins inside its body. The five arms extend from one bulbous central section in which there are three spherical objects suspended in the jellyfish-like goo of its body. Clemens screams and tries to hit it off, but the thing is too fast, scurrying like a spider around to his back and up his neck to the back of his skull. 
He turns around, still trying to rip the thing off him. I watch in horror as the thing stabs three of its arms into his head, two of them just behind the ears and one of them at the base of his skull. Clemens suddenly stops moving. His hands drop to his sides and he straightens up, still facing away from me. The three spherical objects shift inside the creature's body, splitting up and moving down the three arms embedded in his skull. As they reach the areas where the arms narrow and enter his head, the objects elongate, squeezing through. I suddenly realize that those are the eyeballs. Two of them are going to his ears and one to his mouth, traveling through the thing's arms. The other two arms enter his head just behind the temples, sliding around the front of his face, deforming the skin and cutting off Clemens' own vision. The thing turns to me, now controlling Clemens' body. Its three eyes stare, each moving slightly in quick, jerky motions. It moves toward me. I back up to open the torpedo tube, unable to go anywhere else in the cramped room. And then I feel something slimy and wet land on the back of my neck. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and smash that like button to get notified every time I upload a new video. You can also check out some more of my animated horror stories right here.